We are at Project Europe focus on European security issues to deter, defend, and to de improve the resilience against irregular and hybrid threats. For that, we have on today Lieutenant General Kenneth Tovo. Um, he served our nation for 35 years, and he is a West Point graduate. And uh, some of his service assignments include First Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta and Joint Headquarters Center NATO, Deputy Commanding General Special Operations Command Europe, Commands in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Bosnia Herzegovina, and of course, Chief of Staff with the USA Special Operations Command. General Tobo, thank you so much for accepting our invitation, and we look forward to the conversation today. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, we'll get right into it. Um, my first question will take us back a little bit to uh, the OSS and the beginnings of SOF. Um, SOF has been instrumental in World War II. And after World War II, we had 1947, the beginning of the uh, CIA, and 1952, uh, the uh, US Army Special Warfare Program. Back then, it was focused on uh, psychological operations. We called them morale operations, unconventional warfare, and uh, counterinsurgency. Um, a lot of the, the focus uh, today, and I think that's because of popular perception, is that uh, SOF is a direct action capability. As you've been in so many roles across the world, in so many theaters, uh, and you worked with uh, the Green Berets, the SEALs, the Raiders, two, two prong question. If you could talk to us a little bit about the strategic uh, SOF as more than just a direct action capability and at the strategic level, and second, if you could uh, maybe explain a little bit the difference between the Green Berets and maybe other um, areas of SOF and how they're um, very important to the human domain. Yeah, sure. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll probably start with the, the second question first and uh, intertwine the answer to the first a long way. Um, yeah, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, first of all, in the United States, we've got a very large special ops community, right? Um, about 70,000 folks, I think, at last count. Uh, and they really fall into, into kind of two groups. Uh, one are the, you know, we'll call them the commandos, right? The direct action that's very focused on, uh, I'll call it precision targeting, right? Uh, going after a facility, a person, a capability, and, and essentially uh, in almost a, a hyper-conventional manner, performing an operation taking out as much of the uncertainty in this operation and, and performing the action in a high risk environment, contested environments often, and then safely, safely excellent. Um, another part of the, the formation is largely focused on working through an indigenous partner to create effect. And so this is where you really see, this is the, the prime purpose of Green Berets, for example, is to work with a partner could be a friendly uh, military or police force to help enhance their capabilities so that they can affect the environment. Um, it can be through uh, groups of uh, you know, paramilitary or opposition groups to help overthrow a uh, occupying power, a foreign, a foreign uh, power that's, that we're in conflict with. And so it's almost a different mindset. One is very, I'll say enemy centric, right? Go after an enemy capability and, and take care of it. And, and the other part is much more of a long-term complex working through influence, shaping, et cetera, very much human domain centric. That, that is kind of the, the doctrinal difference, if you will. The reality is elements of both of those parts of the SOCOM community kind of end, have ended up doing some of the others uh, uh, portfolio, if you will, over 20 plus years of GWAT, right? We've had Green Berets who have uh, been doing direct action and we've had some of our uh, commando forces, SEALs, et cetera, who have been involved in working with partner forces. But when you look at why, how we selected and trained and assessed the individuals that form those forces, the doctrine of the forces, they're, they're really in, in, in two distinct but complementary capabilities. Now to your, your second question. So how, do, how does that uh, 
serve the nation at the strategic level. Um, and I'll focus primarily uh, on the on the answer to how the that special warfare capability that human centric piece does, because I think it's fairly obvious on, on the commando side, right? It, we, we've all tracked, you know, everything from the Bin Laden raid to, to other discrete direct action operations that have operational and strategic effect. Um, the importance of of this other portion of the portfolio, though, is that as you look at great power competition, much of it plays out. Uh, in this gray zone that is short of conventional conflict. It's still in some ways a conflict. It often has elements of, of violence, et cetera, but it is much more about um, shaping and influencing partners, populations, et cetera, to achieve our aims and set conditions than it is about any, any discrete kinetic action. The operations tend to be long duration, often persistent present op presence operations around the world. Um, and they are almost always through a partner, some kind of indigenous partner on the ground that we are supporting to help them achieve their aims, but also the aims of the US government. And I'll pause there for any follow-up. No, thank you very much for that, sir. We appreciate that, uh, that baseline of everybody on irregular, irregular warfare. Um, I wanna talk about how irregular warfare has evolved or changed um, in recent years, starting with how it's changed, uh, maybe perhaps uh, in 1991 after the Cold War, and then especially the past few years after Russia's overt invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, great question. Uh, I guess the real question is, has irregular warfare evolved or just our perception and definition of irregular warfare evolved? Um, I kind of tend it's the latter. I think you know the, the things that we call irregular warfare have been around really throughout history. Um, how we characterize them has changed and, and how we uh, both train, organize and equip for them, how we how we prioritize them has is really, I think, what's changed. So coming out of the end of the Cold War, uh, you know, we were struggling with this idea that, hey, the, con the conventional threat of the Soviet Union has disappeared and yet the world has not fallen into stability and peace. Right. You'll recall that, you know, the Balkans were was falling apart. You was the this, uh, dissolution of uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, we had major uh, events happening in places in Africa, around the world, and and the particularly the army found itself. You know, and I'll talk from the army perspective. Obviously, it was a, a full joint service effort. Not a lot of our NATO and and other allies were involved as well. But from the U.S. Army perspective, you know, we kept finding ourselves in places that weren't war and weren't really what we prepared for, right? Which is war fighting. And so, you know, here we, we're on the ground in Bosnia doing peacekeeping, uh, in Northern Iraq after the end of the Gulf War, doing refugee operations, all these things around the world. And, and so, you know, the, the original attempt at trying to classify this was the unfortunate acronym called MUTWA, Military Operations Other Than War, um, you know, the first time I heard it, I knew it wouldn't survive as an acronym because it just didn't have cachet, right? But when you look at the, the basket of things that doctrinally were, were thrown into it, it was essentially uh, trying to address this idea of irregular warfare. All these activities that happen short of a tank on tank or tube artillery battle, yet they involve military forces and they often involve violence and conflict. And so I think um, what has changed is our kind of a more nuanced understanding that uh, there is this whole realm of activities short of conventional war. What I think hasn't really kind of come through to most people yet, although the, uh, you know, the, the national defense strategy has, has sort of evolved this way, is really the recognition that this, this, IW conventional war classification is almost an unnatural bifurcation, right? If, if you go back to the kind of kind of the Clausewitzian war as a an extension of politics, a clash of wills to achieve objectives, um, really it's almost more of a of a, a gradation. It's more about ways than it is about the fact that we're in warfare, right? That a nation has has objectives. 
They want to achieve those objectives and they want to achieve them in the most efficient way possible. And, you know, if we could, all, if, if nations could achieve all of their objectives through diplomatic and economic influence and action, they would be satisfied doing that. But sometimes there are objectives that they perceive to have higher value and they're willing to commit more resources all the way up to a full end conventional war. But they don't want to do conventional war if they don't have to, because one, the resource expenditure is huge and the outcome is uncertain. Right? Nobody enters a war thinking they're going to lose. And yet somebody somebody always does, right? Um, you know, I don't think the Russians entered the war in the Ukraine thinking that it would take the expenditure of resources it has to this this point. But but they made the calculation that it was necessary. I will say that, um, you know, so on that spectrum, irregular warfare is a much more likely, historically speaking, a much more likely uh, choice that a nation will make when it wants to achieve objectives particularly in this era of strategic competition, it wants to achieve its objectives or deny its adversary their objectives. And yet it doesn't want to break into the threshold uh, in expenditure of resources, blood and treasure, and uncertainty that conventional war brings. Um, thank you for, for going in depth on this. And I would uh, go into it even more being Project Europe um, I know that our conversations back home are pivoting around retraining and refocusing the way that we, uh, our, our concepts and approaches, given that Europe is such an important element of US foreign policy and our presence globally. Um, I, I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit and because you have so much experience, how irregular warfare in your view is perceived and um, implemented in Europe and how we could do a maybe a better job at this reorganizing and retraining in order to complement that and to be using soft as a force multiplier in this irregular warfare blurred space. Yeah, I, I will uh, I will caveat everything I say by the fact that you know I I'll allow that my experience may be dated. Um, but I've spent you know, a career working in Europe um, or working with European partners outside of Europe in, in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. And I, I would just say that my sense is that many of the militaries have not fully embraced the concept of irregular warfare, of, of seeking asymmetric means to achieve objectives. Uh, you know, to, of mobilizing populations or indigenous uh, elements, et cetera, to try and achieve objectives. Uh, my experience, once again, potentially dated, is that it's very much uh, within the military a very a very conventional focus. Right, it's focused on combat arms, fire maneuver, developing the capabilities that are very symmetrical. Right, meet meet our adversaries tanks, planes, and ships with our own tanks, planes, and ships. And so I think part of that is is got to change. Um, if nothing else, to, to open up the, the available ways in which we can achieve our objectives as, as, a, as an alliance. Um, you know, I, I remember as a, at various times as a, as a Green Beret, a special forces officer, talking about what we did to some of our European soft counterparts. And while they would discuss in NATO parlance, military assistance, using their SOF or other elements to help build the capabilities of a partner or, or an ally. Uh, the whole idea of, for example, unconventional warfare, um, working with partisans to try and overthrow an occupying power was totally not within in the conversation. Despite the the historical the European historical example from World War II, it just wasn't, it wasn't discussed and it wasn't in their portfolio. No, thanks for that. I think you're really hitting on it and you hit on it earlier um, that the U.S. is pretty good at tactically engaging on some of these um, issues to train irregular warfare, to kind of spread the, um, the knowledge base, um, to understand it. But institutionally, we, we kind of lack the ability to 
um, help other nations really build their own uh, irregular warfare definition and understanding. Um, can you can you speak to um, differences you've seen in ways nations have approached irregular warfare and implemented it at an institutional level, not just what they learn from the uh, from the U.S. or the West um, on a tactical level? Yeah, I, I think it, it goes. It varies by nation, right? Some some nations, particularly those in Eastern Europe, have a, a fairly rich history in what we'll call resistance as a as a methodology, national resistance, so the mobilizing of the population. Um, and and I think in those countries, um, there's a uh, there's more interest and, and perhaps institutional interest in examining how to uh, how to pursue that in, in today's environment. Um, you know, the, this issue of how to, how do we help we, the U S or, or other NATO partners help each other in this realm uh, is an interesting one because you're right. We, we are very tactically focused, uh, even in the soft world, you know, when we, when we work with partners, it often is at a very tactical level and it's driven largely by our force structure, right? We've got formations that are designed to, to work at the lowest tactical level and, and then maybe maybe up until the kind of the mid to high tactical if you if you it, put all of an SF group's leadership into into effect but we don't really have structure that we can go and put at a national level those those efforts when we do them are tend to be ad hoc and we rely on things like the Joint Special Operations University out of out of SOCOM to do seminars and fora, et cetera, um, or, or, we, or, the, or the TSOC puts together efforts like that with you know, a collection of experts, et cetera, but, but it's very ad hoc. We don't have a formalized structure uh, and arguably that's a, a, a gap in, the, in our portfolio is the ability to advise and assist at a, at a more operational and strategic level. In, in some cases, Iraq, for example, we put together a structure designed to help our Iraqi partners, Afghanistan, same thing, at, at that high operational, low strategic level to try and address that gap. But but that's a significant commitment because all those people come from, you know, significant positions back in our own force structure. And I think for those two examples, I'm not sure we were successful in either of them, were we? Um, I, I'll counter that, actually. I think we were incredibly successful in Iraq. Um, I think the only thing that saved Iraq when ISIS came to town was the was the multi-year effort to create an Iraqi special operations forces and counterterrorism service structure, high high strategic three-star ministerial level position that reported to the prime minister all the way down to the tactical level. And so, as the Iraqi army disappeared across the country, the only people who stood and fought were ISAF. And, and the folks that led the campaign to retake city after city at the pointy end of the spear was the Iraqi Special Operations Forces created primarily by U.S. Green Berets over a decade worth of work. So I, I would argue that, that, that that's an island of success in an otherwise um, arguably failed capacity development effort with the entire Iraqi army. Uh, we're getting another go at that again. We'll see how how it lasts. But but within ISOF, I'll argue that we we were very successful. Uh, similarly, in in Afghanistan, um, the last things still standing at the end of the the fight were were Afghan commando battalions that were you know overwhelmed at the end. But uh, you know I will say not quite as successful in Afghanistan for a lot of reasons. Uh, but in Iraq, I'll, I I got to tell you, I, I call I call Iraq a win in special forces capacity building efforts, particularly because they were able to continue the, the development of that force even after the 2011 withdrawal. And so the fact that they were able to maintain capability and, and be ready when the fight came back to them again in 13, 14, I think is, is a remarkable testament, not, not only to our efforts, but to their own efforts because they were the ones who drove it in the end. No, I think that's a great point because, a great point because there's a difference between the difference between wars, voting and ending, voting and ending, and, uh, and irregular uh, wars that irregular can wars that can simmer in a lower simmer in a lower past, and less past, visible less visible and I think the the jury's still out on are we successful or not like the story has not ended yet in either of those countries I believe 
Uh, so I'm, I'm interested to see where this goes. And I think it just emphasizes the importance of the IW. I yeah, I guess the question is, uh, you know, what was for Churchill's quote, you know, defeat's not final, victory is, is not, you know, essentially the end state, right? I mean, it's a continual change. So I, I will say at this point in 2024, um, I'm going to call our work with the ISOF a, a success. And at some point you have to say, you know, enough time has passed that yes, things will change over time. But yep. It is the success. They, they there, success. When, they, when, they, when their nation needed them, when ISIS was at the gates of Baghdad, ISOF saved the day. I'll, I'll just leave it there. If we could spend a little bit more on this, um, you've mentioned, um, developing the um the civil the populations i, I would i wanted to come back to that so we're project europe we focus on soft in irregular warfare in europe and i'm sorry i'll always go back to this i think an important element to that especially because we're operating against russia mainly in europe uh, russia looks at war as a continuum as a spectrum and they don't think this we're at war now now we're stopping now we're going forward again um this is very clear if you take a deep dive into russian operational art and how they manage their uh, preparing the environment right um i was wondering i i never understood why it is it was difficult for policymakers and for you know society and military to understand that we're in a continuous as you've mentioned confrontation especially now that we're in these this bigger frame of strategic competition i was wondering if you maybe we can talk a little bit about what we can do better in um raising and just making making it more clear because first usually when you interact with soft with operators they know that and it's easy to talk to them about that how can we translate that maybe to populations policymakers, and start to work on getting the population and societies ready for this because um the unipolar moment never happened for moscow and they continued to to operate in this space in europe yeah. Oh, that's great. I, it's one of the major challenges we have, and it, it, it seems to be the the democratic institution default, right, which is this very um, binary approach in its worldview and its strategic outlook of we're either at war or we're at peace. And, it, and if you look structurally, at least in the U.S., um, it's it's very clear that we're we have this binary outlook, right? If if we're at war, the Title X military command has has lead and has authority and is supported by the other uh, institutions of our government. And everywhere else, we're at peace. And the ambassador is in charge of everything that goes on in that country and has final say. And if he doesn't want a military effort to happen in there, it doesn't happen. And yet, when you look across the, the world where the U.S. has presence and interests, um, you know, the embassy in, in Paris or Germany looks like a different situation than perhaps Lebanon or Yemen. Um, and so we don't really have a, a, a structural understanding of how do we how do we change authorities and, and responsibilities and, 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 and get after that gray zone environment that is not peace and is certainly not war either. So that's part of the problem. Uh, your, your question though, about how do we, how do we affect the uh, the outlook in Europe? Um, I, I would say it's this starts with the civilian leadership of our nations. They they have to essentially mobilize the population and and make them understand the threat that Russia p poses to the West and and in my country in the U.S. Right? It's it's clear that um, democracies only have lasting strength in some of these long-term strategic competitions when the population supports the hard decisions that the politicians have to make, the hard choices in resource allocation, et cetera, to commit to what everybody then believes is an existential threat. Our best example of this in the U.S. is the Cold War, right? Our national leadership maintained popular support it went it ebbed and flowed to some extent but but for by and large they were able to maintain the nation's support 
that it was important for the U.S. to invest in capabilities and in its alliances, et cetera, in order to stop the spread of the Soviet Union. We haven't had that same level of understanding either in this country, and I'd argue in, in Europe, about the, the threat that Russia poses. I mean, how many chances did have we had at this, right? In 2008, they invaded Georgia. And, and I, I was in Europe at the time working at, uh, as a deputy at Sakur. I will say that you know, everybody had their hair on fire for all of maybe two or three months. And then, and then everybody went back, at least in Europe, to buying all their natural gas from, from Russia. And then 14 came and everybody had their hair on fire and maybe maybe it continued. We'll, we'll, I'll grant that people remain focused, particularly in Europe on, on the, what happened in Crimea and Donbass, but, but it didn't generate a mobilization. It didn't generate the development of popular support within the European and US countries about the threat that we face. It certainly didn't generate uh, mobilization of our industrial base for potential conflict. And I'd say that even after the most recent invasion of Ukraine, it's still somewhat ambivalent. We still haven't seen a, a true mobilization by our civilian leadership of the population of explaining to the people the nature of the threat that Russia poses and why it's important that Ukraine not fall still haven't seen a serious industrialization to prepare for war, despite everything we've learned about the conventional war in the 21st century and the huge quantities of, of we're still at, in, in all our nations in the West, um, doling out capabilities to Ukrainians in a very um, constrained manner. Now let's chat about that and, uh, and about the relationship between the leaders who have to really deliver a message to their people to get the support in a democratic country for uh, supporting Ukraine, for example, with security assistance, or you know mobilizing a nation to actually fight, um, whether it's a conventional war or in a regular war, uh, and how we do that. What is the importance of information, and how has technology changed the landscape in recent years? To, to deliver that message from those leaders of those countries um, in order to support uh, an irregular conflict like we're seeing. Irregular conflict like we're seeing. Yeah, you know, in, in many ways, I'd argue that um, the, the technological advances, uh, the ubiquity of uh, the ability of, of outlets to make, should make it easier for our civilian leadership to get their message out. Um, the reality is uh, that's also countered by the fact that um, Minority voices, counter voices, disinformation to include our adversaries disinformation uh, easily penetrates into our own societies and, and can be the counter counter argument to to the official narrative, if you will. Um, you know, one of the I, you know, I, I grew, I'm a cold warrior, right? I started my career uh, in the in the in 79 when I went to West Point but grew up in the eighties in a very cold war centric uh, army, you know, had my first European assignment over in Germany at the end of the cold war. Um, you know, we still had radio free Europe and voice of America broadcasting behind the iron curtain. And that's how we were able to try and get our narrative inside those societies. Um, arguably it made a difference. However, today that is much easier to do on both sides, a little bit more in the favor of our adversaries because we don't, you know, we don't block the internet as as our adversaries do. Um, we don't tamp down on, you know, almost any media source as our adversaries do. Um, but still, arguably, it's much easier today for us to get our information into a place like Russia. But it is certainly easier for them to get counter ideas into our own society and sow disinformation. Um, and so that's a, that's a challenge. And all that aside, I will still say our, our leaders have plenty of means and, and, and avenues to get the message out if, if they chose to make it a priority. No, thanks. Um, and that's, I, I, I I 
one follow on. It, it sounds like you know Russia has the advantage with their disinformation, their active measures, um, as they call it, in our media environment. And we are, um, you know, while Voice America, definitely an example of a, of a way that uh, we can get a counter message into their media environment um, in the past, maybe perhaps today they have regulated and restricted access to the outside world so much that we can't um, as well today as we could in the past. What is your recommendations moving forward on educating uh, Western populations and, or regulating our own media environment uh, to be effective to defend against these um, Russian misinformation campaigns that are ongoing and hear what are, you know, hashtag truths um, in, in our media environment and delivering those to, uh, to Russians as well. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll start off with first, I'm, I'm not a big advocate in, um, in trying to work harder to quote, control our own media environment. I, I have, uh, I have faith that if you put the right facts in front of the American people and, and the, those citizens in the West that, that they're generally well-educated enough to make informed opinions. The challenge is that if, if you've, we've got to get the facts and, and the reasons for our policies out in enough volume and repetition that it isn't drowned out by the misinformation. You know, I think we've I think we've seen our our president really one time go and you know in a, in an address from the White House try and make the case for Ukrainian support. It was after the seven October uh, Gaza attack. But we're two plus years into this war now, and and that's got to be a constant drumbeat. I mean, if you think if you look at how that message was carried during the Cold War, politicians were, were frequently talking about the threat of the Soviet Union and why we had to make the choices we were making. And I don't, I don't think that we've got, and it's not just the president, right? It's at every level of our government, we've got to be, uh, have a more, co more coherent narrative that explains the importance and significance of this fight in the Ukraine to the American people. Because otherwise you've, you've opened space for disinformation and encounter narratives. And I think that's kind of what's happened in, in our country over the last year. And on this, um, I wanted to um, to take the conversation back to, um, to narratives. So the way that the Russian Federation and their predecessor, the USSR has um, been able to influence populations in the Eastern Bloc and in the West as well, because we can see that today. It went beyond media and it went beyond just um, things like Voice of America, or Radio for Europe, which I agree we did a much better job back then. Uh, they went into schools, they went, they restructured the, the school system, the, the, the books that they um, censored and so on and so forth. So um, going forward, clearly we'll have to be a little bit more creative in, in our approaches. That's where I see a lot of room to leverage soft and the intellectual capability that soft warriors are, that our operators are not just, you know, again, direct action um, operators. There's an in, this is an intellectual power that we can use in mentoring other nation and building capacity um, uh, across Europe. I was wondering if you could share a little bit of how you look at this and capacity building missions from this vantage point, but also keep it on um, people don't don't understand this side of soft. Yeah, I, I I think when you when I go back to that kind of two different capability sets within the U.S. SOCOM, um, you know, I talked about the Green Berets and their ability to you know, work with partner partner forces, um, but the other capabilities out there are our uh, special operations civil affairs units and our psychological operations units that are designed to to do sort of what you described, Olga, which is work with uh, a partner nation's information structures as well as civil society to, to help them work on some of the uh, potential fissures that an adversary could, could exploit. 
on you know on the, uh, on the uh, information side to to help them figure out how to do competing narratives, how to get their voice heard more effectively within their society, and how to how to counter some of that Russian disinformation. So that's kind of the psyop side of things. Uh, and then on the on the civil affairs, our special operations civil affairs capability, working with uh, partner organizations in civil society. Um, you know, you look at particularly in some of the uh, uh, Baltic states where they've got significant Russian diasporas and, and kind of examining how those diasporas could be leveraged by our adversary. And then how do you how do you counter that? And you know a lot of work on, hey, how do how do you, country X, deal with your diaspora and perhaps inoculate them from uh, advances by the adversary? How do you better incorporate them into your society? How do you you know ensure that you're respectful of their traditions and culture in your schools, and yet don't let those schools turn into sources of discontent within your own nation. So that that's another aspect of, of kind of the soft portfolio. And those kind of things are always worked very closely with our, our embassy uh, organizations like USAID, uh, the whole of government, but also with the host nation, right? I mean, we're not doing things that, that the host nation doesn't understand and support and advocate for. Um, but it's really to you know, kind of bring a new perspective or a different perspective, if you will, in some of these countries on on different ways they can address aspects of their civil society to both enhance resilience and, and reduce potential cracks and fissures that the adversary takes advantage of. Because that's that's exactly what the Russians do, right? They they look for those chinks in the armor, if you will, and that's their whole active measures program, right? Is find find the weaknesses, exploit the weaknesses then take it into the information domain and, and take a small, a small crack and make it a big fissure. And it's also what you said earlier about us, the United States doing a little bit of a better job at reminding people and telling them our story, because this is also a very important component of, uh, for instance, in Europe, NATO is a key um, element of the European security architecture. And maybe you can um, come back to this. And in your opinion, what do you think the key challenges or opportunities are for NATO um, allies in countering this type of warfare in Europe? Yeah, I, at the very start, I'd say our, our key opportunity is the fact that the West has the best potential narrative going, right? I mean, you can't argue with the standard of living, the freedom economically and socially inside Western society, the, the value of democracy. And, and I think part of this is we need to recognize that we're, we're, we're back into somewhat of an ideological struggle globally, right? Between whether the, the democratic institutions that the West has set up are the, are the quote, best way to organize or or against authoritarian regimes that have organized in a much different way. And so it's not quite the communism versus democracy of the Cold War, but, but it's still an ideological struggle between those that believe that authoritarian regimes are the way to go and those in, in the West and America that believe the opposite. And so I, I think we got to start basically there with touting that, hey, nobody's, nobody's fighting to get into Russia right now. All, all the population flow is going in a different direction from around the world. People are fighting to get into America. They're fighting to get into Europe, out of Africa and everywhere else. And that, that ought to be part of the narrative. Hey, we've got the best system going. And, and as such, it's important. And, and we are under threat from authoritarian regimes around the world. And therefore, we need to band together for our own survival, which is why Ukrainians, the fight in Ukraine is important, right? It, it may be a little distant from America, but we know, honestly, hey, we've tried isolationism a couple times in the 20th century, and it didn't work out all that well for us. And I know there are some people that think we can circle the wagons and we'll do fine here in North America, um, but that's a bet. We, we know that we've done really well 
with the the post World War II global order, and the question is, do we want to do we want to defend it? Uh, that's a great point, sir. But aren't there aren't there some virtues that authoritarian regimes have? Some advantages, perhaps, maybe not virtues, but advantages like uh, their willingness to work with other authoritarian regimes in Africa, for example. We had Wagner. Now I think Russia's calling it Africa Core going down and really supplanting the French, um, really um, being the preferred partner in those places where Western partners won't even work with them because of things like Leahy vetting and you know these higher moral standards that we have. Um, what what would you respond to with that? Yeah, I, I, I would say that we need to kind of look back at our Cold War history. Um, I I, uh, I often throw out, since I have it read about a year ago, is Hal Brand's Twilight Zone that kind of talks through a lot of the, the, the lessons of the Cold War and what they mean for today. It's a great book. Um, and he, he addresses that whole thing, right? I mean, there are some moral dilemmas that we're going to have to choose between, between kind of our morals and, and practicality. And, and, um, and those are hard decisions, right? I mean, but, but if we look at the Cold War, there were times when we supported partners that weren't clearly the democratic institutions that we wanted them to be. Um, but equally over time, some of them became that. I think South Korea is a, a prime example of that, right? We supported South Korea it, it, under the Cold War umbrella for decades. And eventually that country has developed into a, a Western style democracy. So, you know, and this is a, almost a case by case determination that's gotta be made, but when are this balance between uh, where where we're trying to support a nation that is not a democracy or has got authoritarian authoritarian tendencies um, and withdrawing support completely then opens a vacuum for our adversaries to take advantage of as they've done in Africa. Uh, the other challenge there we have is is kind of the uh, the patience and will of democracies over time, right? I mean, the French have given it a go in in North Africa for quite some time. And, you know, I, you know, eventually, I think, made the decision and, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to them as to whether it was the right decision, but that, hey, it wasn't worth the resource expenditure anymore. And they kind of created the vacuum. Uh, we, we didn't do a whole lot, perhaps, to support them as well as we could from a United States perspective, given that they were in, in the fight. So um, it's a it's a hard it's a hard balance, I'd say. When when do your ideals and morals force you to cut away a partner, knowing that it's going to give advantage to the adversary. Because you're right, our, our adversaries have, in, in the authoritarian regimes, have no compunction about working uh, with anybody for their gain, right? You know, I mean, Russia is all across Africa right now, and it's, uh, as is China, focused on resource extraction, it, it basically economic value. Um, yeah, I mean, there are advantage, quote, advantages to authoritarian regimes. Decision making is much tighter, right? They're, they're also, um, you know, I would say democracies have a bias towards inaction. So when you talk about this gray zone conflict um, and, and how we could do better, uh, we, we tend to be very defensive. You know, it, it's right in the name for the Russians. They're active measures. They're, they're, they're doing things. They're creating dilemmas for us. We are often in the responsive defensive mode. And you can't, it's really hard to win on defense. I don't say you can't win on defense, but how to get a better balance, I think, particularly in that, in our conduct of irregular warfare. And I, same applies to, to the European nations. How, how do we get more proactive in this space in, consistent with our democratic processes and values, but we've we've got to be more offensive in order to um, further de try and achieve better deterrence because we have frankly failed at deterrence with the Russians. 
And I think here, and I maybe you can share a little bit of how you what you think about this. But one of the things that I think that we could include in our concept development work when it comes to uh, perpetrating irregular warfare going forward is uh, training and education. I think that's a very important part of deterrence and becoming more familiar from a great power perspective, from the American perspective, different regions, languages, cultures, religions, and I think we shouldn't limit that to just theaters in the classical sense in the conventional sense i was wondering what you how, what do you think about that and do you think that it's something that time is of essence and i think that we're in an irregular conflict and we're a little bit playing catch up as you're saying we're very reflexive but what's your take on training and education from this social cultural perspective and here i include the the diplomatic core the um the uh, soft obviously soft but i look at this as a as a whole enterprise yeah i i, I think there's great value I'm, I'm gonna take training out of the equation um because to me, training is tactics, right? It's developing the responses to known to, to known things, right? Education is where the value is. Uh, I want, I hate to do it to you, but I'm going to bring you back to the Cold War again, right? We we created a huge academic enterprise. I won't call it an industry, but there was a huge academic enterprise, both in the U.S. and across NATO, that that studied our adversary, that, that tried to dissect the Soviet Union economically, leadership, decision-making, culturally, to understand our adversary at, at the micro level, if we could. And it was tough with a, a closed society, but we, we had institutions that understood Russia fairly well, that understood its economic challenges, but also understood decision making. Uh, lost that, right? We, we, in many ways, we reoriented a lot of that academic brain power against terrorism and the causes of Islamic fundamentalism over the last twenty or so years. Uh, we need to reestablish that that level of academic rigor, if you will, and focus. But it's got to be a little more broad, broadly dispersed now, right? Because we need to understand Russia today in the 21st century. We also need to understand China, obviously. Um, and, and in our free time, we could worry about Iran and North Korea and those other actors. But, but you know, if you think of the truly existential threats, China, and I, I think secondarily Russia, we need to understand them at an academic level and, and what makes them tick. Because... That, that's the foundation of good decision making, right? At, on anything, on our diplomatic means, our our economic levers that we're trying to to push and pull. All of those things ought to be founded on an understanding of the adversary and what we think the the consequence of our action will be, given given how their society works. I, I don't think we've got that understanding anymore. Um, and then and then there's the self education. What what I think you're referring to, Olga, is really how do we do a better job um, understanding this continuum of warfare, understanding the nature of the world we live in today? That is, we are we it, we are at war, or at least we're in a a competition that has serious aspects of violence. So you could call it an irregular war if you want, but we're in one right now, or at least multiples. Of one, we're in one with the Chinese. We're in one with the Iranians. We're in one with the Russians, and then, and then get down to that kind of this operational education of hey, what are the options? Part of our challenge, I think, in the U.S. is that um, as you move up the uh, the decision making hierarchy, particularly in, in military responses, but I'll I'll say it's in the other branches of the executive as well. Um, there's not a there's not a deep understanding of the other tools of power we have to apply beyond the old standbys of sanctions and kinetic action, dropping precision bombs on somebody, send in the tomahawks. There's, there's not a lot of understanding or even discussion from what I've seen of the other tools and options, unconventional warfare, 
partner assistance, all those other things, I think is is a fairly fairly shallow uh, uh, tool in the toolkit from an uh, educational experiential uh, perspective inside the highest levels of government. Yeah, no, thanks for that, sir. I think we'll let's go a little deeper there. Um, I want to hit the forums in the last ten minutes that we have on some of the questions. And you said like we're pretty good at the kinetic, you know, military option. We even have the sanctions and the economic instrument. We talked a little bit about the power of the information instrument. Um, but let's talk a little diplomacy and uh, military diplomacy. I think the SFABs might be a good example of that. Um, do you think that SFABs um, should be expanded? Um, and are they being used correctly? Are we trying to make the regular army more irregular or should we kind of grow um, special operations, irregular warfare kind of capabilities? Yeah, you know, I, th I think the SFABs were a, uh, a, a clear recognition by the army that partner development isn't purely a soft task, right? Um, there, there were have been periods of time in which, you know, a partner needed a very conventional capability to meet the challenges inside their society, inside their country. And, you know, so we had special operators, Green Berets, you know, doing basic training for infantry battalions. Um, and frankly, that's, it's not a, uh, it's not an appropriate use of the resource, right? That same resource should be doing higher end work with other partners. Um, and in some cases, it was frankly not not within the skill set of of special operators. You know, everything from developing MI companies or you know teaching tank warfare or or other aspects that are much more suited to the Army's conventional formations. You know, and and that was really what was happening in Afghanistan to some extent, right? The and, and the other aspect was that that takes generally kind of NCO and above leadership for that kind of an effort. And so the army at one point in Afghanistan was stripping privates out of their units, leaving them at home and sending the NCOs and officers overseas to work with Afghan forces on these training and advise missions. So they, you know, it was a, an answer to a structural issue at that time, but it was also this recognition that the army has a role in helping partners develop particularly conventional capabilities. I don't, I don't think it's a, I don't think, at least I've not seen it used as a tool for building more irregular warfare capabilities. Now, to the Army's credit, one of the things they did was create echelons of, of advise and assist teams, right? So there is a capability at, at echelons above tactical because the recognition is, hey, it's great that you create an infantry battalion, but you also have to create all the structures that make an infantry battalion operational over the long term training, logistics, intel, those kind of things. So I I don't know that we have really, even with the SFAB creation, stepped fully into the mindset of creating structure to really advise and assist partners with an irregular warfare view on things. I think much of what the SFABs are doing, probably not all, but much of it is very conventional capability focused. Because that's what that's what our army is is designed for, right? Conventional capability. I think that's part of the point of like we're designed for uh, one very conventional fight, and we need to become more irregular to address the current need and the current really facets of competition that we're seeing. Yeah, yeah. I think I mean the army's challenge has been, and this goes back to those those nineties years that I referenced earlier. When we were talking about you know the the thesis at that time, and I was sitting in you know Fort Leavenworth for two years, CGSC and then SAMS, and and the Army's philosophy at that point was a unit trained to high end combat could do all those other things. They were considered lesser included cases, and so when you'd have discussions of hey why are we still focused on high end combat against a Soviet like uh, threat even after the Soviet Union's disappeared, it was all about hey we, if we can do this. We can do everything else, lesser included in case. Let it lesser included case. Uh, I, I think I think we've learned a couple times in our history that hey, counterinsurgency, for example, is not a lesser included case of conventional combat. Uh, I'd argue unconventional warfare certainly not a lesser included case. They're often intertwined. 
They often exist in the same operational environment, um, but the formation that does, you know, the, the armored assault across the folded gap is not the same one who's necessarily ready at a moment's notice to go do peacekeeping, unconventional warfare, counterinsurgency, et cetera. We've, we, I think we still struggle with that, but it's a resource choice, right? The biggest resource for the army being time. What do I train on? What's, you know, it's, it's the risk matrix. Likelihood of occurrence versus uh, seriousness of outcome. And generally when the army looks at that risk matrix, army leaders say, yeah, I may have to go do those other things, but I got to be ready for high end war against an adversary. And that's what they train to. And, that, and that's a fair choice, particularly because I, I would argue that the Army's significant investment in special operations gives them that mitigation against the irregular warfare threats. That, that's to my, when I was the USASOC commander, that was my view. Hey, part of my job is to be the Army's risk mitigator for what they're not able to do in preparation for IW environments. No, thank you very much. I think um, we might have time for one more question and uh, over Olga for the last one and uh, taking us to the end. Um, I wanted to uh, maybe get your take on, uh, we talked extensively about understanding adversaries and uh, Russia and to some extent China for Europe. Um, what, how do you, what, what, is, what is your your take on us understanding our allies and partners a little bit better and maybe by doing that, optimizing and speaking to resources, optimizing our resources and um, growing a capability to counter IW in Europe? Yeah, that's an awesome question. Um, we, we tend to assume that everybody in the Alliance is like us and, uh, or just, you know, kind of, mini me's of us, right? That they look the same, they have the same capabilities, perhaps in a smaller package, but but the reality is um, we need to do a much better job of, of sort of, let's call it the uh, alliance self-awareness, right? A, a better analysis of what we have collectively and, and what are various allies um, kind of best areas of potential uh, involvement, right? Some, some countries probably have a much better understanding of the adversary than we do. They're closer to the problem. Um, some of our recent entries, you know, Finland, for example, probably has a much more micro understanding of Russia than, than, than we do or than other members of the alliance. And then all the way down to tactical capabilities. You know, we, we don't have the resources anymore, particularly when you look at a, a essentially a global, a global commitment, global competition with China and all the other adversaries we've talked about to do everything ourselves. And I think our, our national defense strategies have and security strategies have, have acknowledged that, right? And we've talked more and more over the years about reliance on partners and allies. Now the question is, how do you take that down to, uh, to an operational level? And I think it starts with kind of an assessment right? An, an understanding of what are our capabilities, where are our shortfalls, and then who are, the, who are the best nations to fill particular roles and niches inside this. And then we've got to, we, the U.S., have to commit to being good partners. Um, and that means being willing to share what we know, uh, assist where we can, um, but we we sometimes, not always, sometimes tend to kind of say, just follow us and do what we tell you to do. And that's not being a good partner. Thank you. Um, clearly we could have, um, I propose a weekly fireside chat about this because I can definitely spend <laughs> an hour every week talking about this. But in the end, sir, um, if you could tell us a little bit about your work with the Green Beret Foundation, what you do and how we can support. Great, appreciate the opportunity. So uh, for about the last four and a half years, I've been the you know, volunteer to be the chairman of the board of the Green Beret Foundation. It's a, a nonprofit that supports our active duty and former Green Berets and their families. Uh, essentially, the, the thesis is, you know, our Green Berets have been in this struggle. They are in the gray zone day in, day out, uh, 70 or so countries around the world every day of the year, uh, highly committed, 
uh, doing hard work, still many of them bearing the wounds of war of Afghanistan, Iraq, and other places. Um, and so we we exist as a nonprofit to to meet needs that the government does. We've got the greatest set of uh, of government benefits in the world, but there are still gaps in what we can provide our our Green Berets and their families. And so uh, we exist to to help when we're doing everything from um, alternative PTSD treatments that are not yet Tricare approved or VA approved uh, to you know helping helping spouses with uh, education, given the constant moves of an army lifestyle, so that they can figure out how to how to build new career certifications, et cetera, to to help their family, uh, as well as uh, we're heavy in the transition now, um, uh, helping folks get their VA benefits as they exit the service, as well as moving on to uh, gainful employment or participation in in civil society. You know, my argument is that our Green Berets are. The, the, the best of the best in our military there it's a highly se- selective process uh, and and they're committed individuals and and the nation needs their service out in our society whether they're in business government or nonprofit world the, the our, our society will be better for their successful landing in society and so we we aim to help them so that's Greenberry Foundation in about 30 seconds well thank you thank you uh, for your continued support. Go on. I should. I guess I should end that with a paid political advertisement. With and if you want to learn more, go to GBF found, or GreenBrayFoundation dot org. Uh, there's obviously you can see our programs and services, and there's a big donate button on the on the screen. If you are not doing that, I was going to do that because I always end with a shameless plug of West Point and the Irregular Warfare Initiative. So because I was uh, not able to say my part in the beginning, I will do it in the end. Uh, please do go on log online and check out the Green Beret Foundation because indeed uh, our armed forces are an, an asset to our nation and that whether it's during active duty or not and their families as well, but also support the Irregular Warfare Initiative, my shameless plug. Follow us on our social media uh, channels um, on X, formerly known as Twitter, on LinkedIn, YouTube, and obviously submit content, feedback. General Tovo, you know you'll be back on our on our uh, <laughs> on our fireside chat. Thank you again for for accepting our invitation, and thank you for your continuous support. And thank you, Michael, for being my wingman as usual. We will see you next time. Next time we will have Mr. Jack Devine. He's a a veteran of the Central Intelligence Agency, and he ran the operations outside of the United States during the Cold War. So I hope that we will continue this human domain-centered conversation about uh, IW in Europe going forward. Thank you again, gentlemen, and thank you everyone for tuning in.